the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. And so it's good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you go with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 is where we're going to be at this morning. And when you get it, um, if you don't mind just looking like you have it, um, that'd be helpful. If you, don't, if you can't find it, then just fake it. It's good. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. It says this, it says, When the king of Aram was waging war against Israel, he conferred with his servants, My camp will be at such and such a place. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Be careful passing by this place, for the Arameans are going down there. Consequently, the king of Israel sent word to the place the man of God had told him about, And the man of God repeatedly warned the king so that the king would be on his guard. So the king of Aram was enraged because of this matter. And he called his servants and he demanded of them, Tell me, which one of us is for the king of Israel? One of the servants said, No one, my lord the king, but Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in your bedroom. So the king said, Go and see where he is so I can send men to capture him. And when he was told... Elisha is in Dothan. He sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there. And they went by night, and they surrounded the city. So when the servant of the man of God got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, Oh, my master, what are we to do? And Elisha said, Don't be afraid. For those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed, Lord, would you please open his eyes and let him see? And so the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Uh, To start off this morning at the risk of sounding unspiritual and at the risk of you judging the pastor this morning, how many of y'all have ever been in a situation or a moment where it seemed like God was doing nothing? My hand's up too where it seemed like there was something going on, or there was a circumstance or a situation in life that had, maybe it wasn't a literal army, but it had surrounded us, and we felt like there was no inevitable way out, and the only thing by sight we could see was that God was up to nothing. But I want you to help me tell my sermon title to your neighbor today, or if you don't like your neighbor, you can tell it to someone around you. But uh, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him this. He's doing something. He's doing something. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So would you pray with me? And then uh, we will dive in. Lord, we love you. And God, I thank you so much for uh, the music that we've already heard this morning. I thank you for Brother Matthew and Darrell and Keith and Trey and all they do every single week. I um, want to prepare our hearts for the word. And uh, what I pray now as we dive into 2 Kings chapter 6, where this word is not outdated, this word is living, it's breathing, it's active than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we believe that it has a, a word to say to us today. So what I pray you prepare our hearts, what I pray that you'd use me, and um, what I pray that we walk away um, with our faith strengthened and encouraged, and when we walk away thinking about you, Jesus. We love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't you hate it when you make plans and your plans get messed up? Anybody hate that? I, I am not a huge planner. My wife can attest to that. I am very much a uh, fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. You know, we can make something happen at the last second. I'm cool with that. But... I will say, if I go through the trouble of making plans with someone, I want that person to follow through. You know, if I, if I go through the trouble of making plans with a group of people, I would like to actually follow through with what we planned on doing. And I get a little frustrated sometimes if the plans that I make don't actually work out. And so what we're seeing here in this chapter of 2 Kings and 2 Kings 6 is that the king of Aram, or also your Bible might say the king of Syria, it's the same place, just Syria is modern day Aram, so that's why it might be a little different. But the king of Aram is making these plans to attack Israel. And yet every time he makes these plans, his plans keep following through. 
If he plans to attack the king of Israel here, he might hear word that the king of Israel is over here. So he goes and he moves and he's ready to attack. But when he gets there, someone has already let the king of Israel know. And the king of Israel has moved. And this man's plans just keep messing up. So he gets frustrated. So, so what he does is he calls all of his men together. He calls all of his servants and says, okay, one of you has to be a spy. Right? We're making these plans in a, a small room with a select group of people. And yet still, plan in and plan out, the king of Israel is still hearing about when we're coming and where we're coming. So one of you must be a spy. But when one of his men speaks up in that room and he says, actually, none of us is for the king of Israel, but there's a man of God for the king of Israel. There's a prophet named Elisha who, who apparently God is giving him insight to see even what you're speaking in your own very bedroom. That this man, Elisha, has been able to tip the king of Israel's hand and let him know when you are coming. Now, if we know our Bibles, um, Elisha is a pretty big deal, isn't it? We, we just sang about Elijah with a J, right? And Elisha, in our passage here in 2 Kings, he's the prophet that follows Elijah. And so we have Elijah in 1 Kings and we have Elisha here in 2 Kings. And these men were prophetic voices to the people of Israel. They were speaking on behalf of God particularly to the kings, right? That is their role in God's story. And let me just tell you what, Elisha is one of those guys that you want to be around. You know those people in church that you just feel like you're more spiritual because you're with them? You know, you just feel like you love Jesus a little bit more because you're sitting behind or beside this person, right? Elisha, in the book of 2 Kings, he's one of those men. I mean, we'll look at in just a minute all the miracles that Elisha is able to do, that God uses him to do. I mean, it is miracle after miracle, amazing event after amazing event. He's really one of the most incredible men in all of the Old Testament. And God is using him in an incredibly powerful way to be able to direct and give the king of Israel guidance and understanding and give him insight into the king of Aram's plans. But how many of y'all know that just because you might be in a situation in life where you're, you're following God, you're, your faith is in God, you're following Jesus as best you can, you're, you're doing the things that a Christian's supposed to do, how many of y'all know that that does not always protect you from difficult situations coming into your life? It doesn't always do that. You know, I think sometimes if we're not careful, and I know I did this when I was younger and growing in my faith, but we can equate peace in our life to how well we're following Jesus. So what I mean by that is if I'm going to church and if I'm preaching every Sunday and if I'm serving and if I'm doing all these things for God, then that must mean that God is going to make me just have like a peaceful life. You know what I'm saying? And so if I ever encounter situations in my life that aren't peaceful, if I ever encounter difficult situations, then that wasn't God allowing me to go through it, but that was just I messed up in my walk with him. I need to get something right. That's how I used to think. But, but the more that I read God's word, I'm just finding that over and over and over again, we see stories of men and women of God who place their faith in God. They, they follow him as faithfully as they possibly can, and yet they keep on running into difficult and trying situations. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we took our uh, high school students. As Matthew said, I'm the high school pastor here at First Baptist, and I love my job. I, I think all the time, I can't believe I get paid to do this. And uh, I, it was funny, I commented on one of my pictures that I posted and I said, I can't believe I get paid for this. And preacher Mike commented and he said, we're paying you, question mark. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, and I appreciate it. Um, but I love, I love doing what I get to do. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we took our high school students to camp. And uh, at camp, we walked through the book of Daniel. And Daniel was one of those stories that I'd heard growing up in VBS and I'd heard growing up in, uh, in church here. I'd heard all these things, but I never studied Daniel for myself. You know, how many of y'all know that there's a difference in someone telling you something and you learning something for yourself and on your own? And um, I began to study the book of Daniel, and I was amazed. I was amazed at the faith that Daniel, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego display in that book. It's absolutely incredible. But if you know that story, you know that their faith in God does not necessarily protect them from difficult situations, does it? Their faith leads three of them to a fiery furnace and the faith of another leads them to a den of lions. And you might be like, Justin, we know how that story ends. They come out good and that's true, but I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to be thrown into a fiery furnace for my faith. <laughs> I would rather it if God protected me from those things, right? I think about one of our favorite stories of Jesus probably when Jesus walks on water and calms the storm. 
You know that story? When, when the disciples are freaking out because Jesus isn't on their boat and it seems like everything is going crazy and they're wondering, Jesus, where are you? And Jesus walks on water. He comes out, he calms the storm and all is well. And we love that because we love to say that Jesus can calm any storm in our life. True. But that story takes on a little bit of a different perspective when you read the beginning and you realize that Jesus told his disciples to go out into the storm. He says, go across the sea and I'll meet you on the other side. So it wasn't like the disciples were disobeying Jesus and so bad things happened. They were obeying Jesus and yet they still find themselves in the middle of a terrifying situation. The thing about we love reading the, the epistles of Paul, don't we? Then we love reading Romans 8, that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. We, we love Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. But if we aren't careful, we forget that one of many whom would say is one of the greatest Christians that we see in the New Testament, most of his ministry is spent in a prison cell. That just because you're following the Lord... Just because you're faithfully walking, that does not mean that God is going to bubble wrap protect you and you're not going to go through anything in your life. And I say all that to think that Elisha's story here echoes that same sentiment. I mean, he's doing what he's supposed to do as a prophet, isn't he? He's giving the king of Israel insight. He's letting the king of Israel know the king of Aram's plans. He is following God. We've seen miracle after miracle after miracle in 2 Kings. God is using him in an amazing and an incredible way, but Elisha... And his servant are about to wake up to a pretty difficult circumstance. The king of Aram finds out that it's Elijah and he says, go find where he is. And when he finds out where he is, he's going to go and attack him and surround an army around him. Now, isn't it interesting that the king of Aram is trying to catch a guy who has seen all the plans that he's made. And so he makes a plan to go catch a guy who has seen all the plans that he's made. <laughs> Can I just tell you, this is just parenthetical. Your anger and frustration will make you do some stupid stuff. Right? We laugh, but some of you know. And if we don't check that, sometimes we end up doing some stupid things. And this guy is going to make plans to attack this guy. But apparently, I wonder if he was surprised. Because every move that he makes, the king of Israel sees. He's two steps ahead of him, right? And I wonder if this king of Aram was actually surprised when he shows up to Dothan and he actually finds that Elisha is still there. Elisha and his servant have not moved. And so look what happens in verse 15. It says, when the servant of the man of God, that's the servant of Elisha, got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. Have you, have you ever woken up to an unexpected situation? What, what I mean by that is I was a notorious sleepwalker when I was growing up. Um, like it was bad. Like I, I would wake up every now and then and I would have no idea where I was. I mean, I was in my house somewhere, but it was just a terrifying thing. To wake up and you think you're going to wake up in bed, then all of a sudden you're waking up and your dad's in the kitchen asking you what you're doing, you know? It's such a weird experience. And I have to imagine this guy gets up and he's probably not have a care in the world. I mean, Elisha's with him. He's got a guy who can see the plans that other kings are making. He's probably just waking up peacefully. He walks out of his tent. Maybe he stretches a little bit. He maybe throws some water on his face. And then he looks up. And you know the face in the Andy Griffith show that Barney Fife makes when he's surprised or shocked by something? You, you know that face? Young people are like, dude, you're the youth pastor. What are you talking about? <laughs> Great show. You know that face he makes that's just shocked and surprised? I have to think that that's the way the servant responds here. Hey, he wakes up and it's been a good night's sleep. He comes out and to his shock, to his surprise, and frankly, to his horror, he wakes up and there is an entire army not there to say hey, but, but an army that's there coming after him and the man that he's serving, coming after Elijah. And you know what I think as I get here? He has one or two ways that he can respond. This man, seeing this thing around him, seeing this army around him, he has one of two ways that he can respond. He can either respond in faith or he can respond in fear. He can either respond by faith or he can respond by fear. And we read the story, but let's look at what he does. He says, so he asked Elisha, oh my Master, what are we to do? Is this a faithful response or is it a fearful response? It's fearful, right? He, he walks in the tent and he's like, what is going on? We got this army surrounding us and we know he's scared because Elisha basically tells him in the next verse, don't be afraid. He walks in and he's freaking out 
Because the circumstances and situations in life are enclosing him. Can we just pick on this guy for just a minute? Because let's just be honest together. This was not an appropriate response. This is not a response that someone who's walking with Elisha, someone who we can assume probably had his faith in God because of who he's serving, this is not the appropriate response, is it? I mean, think about all this man knows. He's been walking with Elisha, a prophet of the Lord who knows the word of God better than almost anyone. He would have known all about the God that we just sung about. He would have known that the God that they placed their faith and trust in looked out at nothing, spoke to nothing, and everything started becoming from nothing. He would have known that God created all things, right? He would have known about the story when God sees his people in slavery and his people are in bondage and the Lord just shows off in a major, incredible way. He does 10 plagues. He splits the Red Sea open like only God can. He would have known that God was able to do that. He would have certainly known the history of the Israelites as they came into the promised land. And it didn't matter how tall the wall of Jericho were, or it didn't matter what kind of city they came up against, but God was faithful to provide for his people. He would have known this. He would have probably known in Psalms chapter 3, where David wrote, even though 10,000 are coming against me, I will not fear. He would have probably known Psalm 27 where David says, even though an army is deployed against me, I will not be afraid. He would have known all this stuff, right? And even on top of that, think about the man who he's serving. Think about the prophet of God that he is with. In 2 Kings chapter 3 through 2 Kings chapter 8, we see miracle after miracle after miracle that Elisha does. Can I just give you a few of them? In 2 Kings chapter 3, The Lord uses Elisha to bring water to a dry desert. He uses Elijah to provide water in a place where it seemed like water was impossible. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the Lord uses Elisha to multiply this widow's oil. She's running out of oil, and yet God uses Elisha in a miraculous way to provide for this woman. There is in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a Shunammite woman who's been barren for so long and Elisha prophetically speaks over her life and she has a son and later on that son dies and Elisha raises that son up again from the dead. In Elisha, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a place where the people are running out of bread to eat and so Elisha kind of pulls a Jesus moment here, right? And he multiplies bread for hundreds of people to eat. In 2 Kings chapter 5, he heals Naaman, who's a commander in the king of Aram's army of a skin disease. And then just earlier, in 2 Kings chapter 6, an axe head falls into the river and Elisha makes that thing float. Pretty crazy stuff, right? So if you're thinking, if I'm the servant of this man, if I'm the servant of Elijah, I walk out and I might be distracted by a second or for a second by the people surrounding me. I might be kind of set back for a moment wondering what are we going to do, but then I stop to remember Hold on, I know the God whom I serve is awesome. I know the God whom I serve is incredible. I know the God whom I serve can do anything that he pleases. And then on top of that, I'm with someone whom God has used in amazing, miraculous ways. I know it looks bad, but I don't have to be afraid. That's how the man should have responded, isn't it? But he doesn't. He doesn't. Instead of responding in faith, He responds in fear. Here's what I'm learning as I grow up a little bit to a young 24. (laughs) Here's what I'm learning. It's really easy to pick on someone when you don't know or haven't been in their situation. You know, I'm learning as a a youth pastor, I'm learning this, that it's really easy to judge a student when I don't know what that student goes home to after Wednesday nights. That it's really easy to judge someone or pick on someone on a Sunday morning and we don't, we don't know what their work week was like or what their work week is going to be like. It's easy to do that. And so on this stage and this morning in these nice seats with new sound stuff and all these things, it can be really easy for us to pick on this guy. And be like, man, you should have responded in faith, not in fear. Ye of little faith, right? God is so awesome. God is so good. Why are you responding this way, but I don't know about you, and maybe I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me this morning, but so often circumstances come up in my life, and it's not a literal army, right, but there's moments when I'm wondering, God, what are you doing? Moments in my life when I'm wondering, God, what are you up to? And then instead of responding immediately in faith, I often respond in fear. 
And can I tell you what frustrates me about this? What, what frustrates me about this is I know God's word. Right? I'm going to just give you a few. I know in Exodus 14 that the Lord says, you just need to be still. I'm going to fight for you. I know the word says that. I know the word says in Isaiah 40 that he gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. I know it. I know in Isaiah 43 that it says when we pass through waters and walk through fire, we will not be disturbed or burned. I know that Isaiah 54 says that no weapon formed against me will prosper. I know Deuteronomy 31 says that God will never leave me nor forsake me. I know that in Romans 8, that it says all things are working together for the good of those who love him. And I know that Matthew 6 says God knows all of my needs so I don't have to worry. But yet time and time again, stuff comes up in my life and situations happen in my life. And if I'm not careful, I can quickly respond in fear and not in faith. And even on top of that, I can tell you story after story after story of how God's moved in my life. We could go row by row, seat by seat, section by section in this place, and you could hear story after story after story about how God has been good, about how God has been faithful, about how God made a way when it didn't seem like there was any way. But yet some of us would walk out of this room and tomorrow something happened and we question everything we just heard. So I think it's easy for a second to pick on this man, but maybe we better hold off of that for just a moment, shouldn't we? Because I think so often we can respond in fear and not in faith. Because you know what? I had you raise your hand this morning if there was ever a moment in your life when it seemed like God was up to nothing. I think that's where this man finds himself in. Because you know what I never noticed until honestly probably my fourth or fifth time reading through this passage. But think about how messed up it is that God did not give Elisha a hint that this king was coming against him. You ever thought about this? Because what do we know? Earlier in the passage, Elisha's getting insight for when the king of Aram is attacking the king of Israel. He's getting that over and over, right? I mean, it sounds like it happened multiple times. So so multiple times over and over, God is letting Elisha see the king of Aram's plans so that Elisha can warn the king of of Israel. But now when the king of Aram turns his forces against Elisha, the the Israelite servant comes out and he's like, yo, God, where was the heads up? You've been letting us know the plans when he's trying to attack someone else. But now apparently he's attacking us and we're still here. He's in a moment where it seems like God was up to nothing. Where it seems like God was doing nothing. You know what's um, interesting is I'm sitting here learning as I grow up a little bit more how uh, when you experience, if two people experience the same event, if two people experience the same circumstance or the same situation, oftentimes you can get two completely different responses, can't you? Which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's the same thing. Same thing happening, but yet two different responses. I, I love one of my favorite pictures ever is uh, I went to back when the Panthers were really good uh, in 2015. And um, I love my Panthers. I'm being faithful. I'm sticking with them. Uh, back when we were 15 and 1 in 2015, one of the greatest years of my life. And uh, we were, don't, don't judge me. You know. You know. We went to a Panther game, me and uh, my buddy Johnny Sprinkle and my buddy Eli Blaylock, we went to a Panther game, and they are playing the Falcons. And um, I hate the Falcons, right? Hate them. And um, I know they got Christians on that team. I don't care. I don't like them. And um, <laughs> I don't care. And um, don't judge me. Anyway, we go to this game. Eli is a Falcons fan. Me and Johnny are Panther fans. And to the best of my memory, we beat them boys 38 to nothing that day. Which, if you know the NFL, shutouts are so hard. I mean, 38 to nothing just does not happen. And I love, there's a picture of me on one side, Eli in the middle, and Johnny on the other side. And and me and Johnny, we just watched the same game, just experienced the same event, and yet me and Johnny are grinning ear to ear, and Eli looks like his dog just died, right? (laughs) Just We experience the same thing, and yet the same event is bringing about completely different responses. And what we're about to see in 2 Kings 6 is while one man steps out, same situation, same circumstance, and he responds by fear. Elisha is about to step out and he's going to respond in faith. Same event, same problem, chariots are surrounding, yet one is fearful and one is being faithful. Look at what it says in verse 16. It says, Elisha said, don't be afraid. For those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. Can you imagine the servant as he heard those words? Can you imagine him poking his head out of the tent and looking back and he's like, 
No, they're not. <laughs> What's going on? But look at what Elisha says. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Here's what I think it's important that we recognize this morning. It's important that we understand what Elisha does not pray, okay? He, he does not pray, God, we are in a situation right now. We need you to show up and do something. He doesn't pray that. He, he does not pray, God, would you please come and would you begin to move because we are in a bind right now. He does not pray that. He, he does not pray, God, I know by your sovereign hand you allowed us to endure this, but Lord, would you please come and make something happen. Listen, he does not pray any of those things because all of those prayers would assume that God is not currently at work. He does not pray, Lord, would you come? Would you do something? Would you show up? No, Elisha is already knowing that God is doing something behind the scenes. God is already there. And so instead of praying, God, would you show up? He says, Lord, would you open my servant's eyes so that he can see how you're already working? Do you see the difference there? Because as I study this passage, I'm, I'm telling you, my, my prayer life is being challenged. Because oftentimes that's my initial prayer. So something happens and I immediately pray, God, would you move? God, God, would you show up in my life? God, would you start to do something? But maybe my prayer life this morning needs to shift from this place where I'm like, God, would you move? God, would you do something? Instead, to God, I don't see how you're moving. I don't see what you're doing. But God, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. I'm trusting that you're working out all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I'm trusting in what your word says. And so, God, I might not be able to see it, but help me to see where you're already moving. Because listen, if we're not careful in our prayers, we can assume that God is absent. In our prayers, if we're not careful, we can assume that God is not doing anything. That he's up to nothing. But Elisha's prayer assumes that God is already up to something. He just prays that his servant will be able to see it. You know, I think and I look at this passage and I'm just looking at, man, Elisha is embodying the Christian life here in this one verse, isn't he? Because what is the Christian life? What does 2 Corinthians chapter 5 say in verse 7? Does it say this? That as Christians, we walk by sight and not by faith. No. That's not what it says, right? It does not say that we walk by sight and not by faith. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that we walk by faith and not by sight. So one man comes out and he looks. And his sight is telling him that everything is going wrong. His sight tells him that they might not make it out of this morning alive. His sight tells him that God is up to nothing. But Elisha steps out by faith and says, we might not be able to see it right now, but God is up to something. He's up to something. I, I got to tell you, I love the moments in my life when I can see God moving. Are those not amazing moments? Are those not just amazing times when it just seems that every day, every single turn we make, it's I can see God moving in my life. I know I told the story at 8 o'clock at, um, at camp a few weeks ago. We had a student that dropped out like four days before camp. And as a youth pastor, we have that spot paid for. It's there. And I'm like, I'm like man, that stinks. This kid was going to experience God in an awesome way. And so we told his friend, we said, man, if you can find someone to fill that spot, you can fill it. So he starts calling people, calling people, calling people. And Finally gets on the phone with one of his friends who's never been in church, family, doesn't go to church anywhere, nothing like that. And the kid basically just comes to get away and have a fun week. And the boy comes, and the last night of camp, I ask if anyone wants to repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Christ. And that young man looks up at me. And I look. Yeah, we can clap for that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I look at that, and I can tell you story after story of moments in my life where it was so evident how God was working things out where it was so evident how God was doing something. But as many of you already attested this morning, there are going to be times when our sight would tell us everything opposite of that. I hope I don't sound unspiritual to you this morning, but there's moments in life when our sight would tell us that God is up to nothing. That currently in the matter, God's not doing anything. You know, Justin, that's a really encouraging message to hear as a guest pastor well can I just encourage you like look at the Bible 
mean, let's just walk through a few of these people just real quick. Abraham. He's promised the incredible promise of a land, universal blessing, offspring. I mean, one of the greatest promises that a man can receive, Abraham receives that in Genesis chapter 12. And guess what? He don't see nothing for 25 years. You got to think Abraham at like his 87th birthday was like, God, it's been 12 years, right? Nothing. What about the people of Israel? They uh, are clinging to the promise that God gave Abraham. We're going to be this great people. We're going to be this great nation. There's going to be a blessing that comes through us. But I don't know about you, but great nations don't look like people who are enslaved by other nations. And yet, what do we see in the book of Exodus? They're enslaved for 430 years. We get mad if God don't answer a prayer in a week. 430 years. Seemed like God was doing nothing. What about the story of Ruth? I love Ruth's story where her husband dies at a young age and she's forced to move to another place with her mother-in-law and her life just seems to be spinning out of control because if God was with her and if God was doing something, surely her husband would not have died. Yeah, that's where she finds herself in life. What about David? David is anointed the next king of Israel as a boy. Kills Goliath and it seems like he's on this upward trajectory towards the throne. But then we know that Saul goes a little crazy and David spends a good portion of his life running around from cave to cave hiding because the current king is trying to kill him. I mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel earlier, but we can repeat it again. They faithfully follow God. They stand when everyone else bows. David, Daniel prays when he's told not to because he knows he's not supposed to pray to a king, but he's supposed to pray to God. And yet three of them find themselves in a furnace and one finds himself in the den of lions. And finally, what about Esther? The, the book of Esther, where did you know that if you read through the book of Esther, you know what the one thing you will not find is? God's name. How's that in the Bible, right? You read the whole book and you never see God's name mentioned. For so long, it seems like he's doing nothing. And you might be like, Justin, I still don't, I still don't buy it. I'm, I'm still not there with you. I, I don't get it. Well, let me just encourage you and turn your gaze towards the cross. Because what Jesus comes into this earth in a miraculous way, doesn't he? Virgin birth and he begins his ministry. And to say that his ministry is epic is probably selling it a little bit short. Walks on water. Feeds 5,000 people, makes blind people see, lame people walk, deaf people hear, even raises up people from the dead. Amazing, amazing things. He comes into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna, to palm branches being laid in his honor. It seems like God is for that man. Yet the story turns, doesn't it? And he's betrayed. He's arrested. He's falsely accused. He literally takes the place of a criminal. They say, you can release Barabbas or release Jesus. Which one do you want us to release and which one do you want us to crucify? And they say, release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. He's beaten. He's mocked. He's hung on a cross. He bleeds all the amount of blood you could possibly bleed and he dies and is thrown into a tomb. And now listen here, I know we know how the story ends already. I get that, but listen, if there was ever a moment when it seemed like God was not working, that was it. If there was ever a moment when it seemed like, God, you are up to nothing, it was as the Son of God was dying on a tree. So I'm just here to tell you that sometimes your sight will lend you to believe and will push you to think that God is up to nothing. But can I encourage you this morning? That when our sight would tell us that God is up to nothing, he's doing something. He is doing something. Because you know what? Abraham had to wait 25 years, but guess what? He saw Isaac. The, the people of Israel were enslaved for 430 years, but then God shows up with a mighty hand as only God can. And even when they were between an army and a sea, God splits the sea to deliver his people. Man, Ruth was probably questioning God, why are you doing nothing? But God was orchestrating Ruth so that she would become the great grandmother of King David. Speaking of David, David has to hide in caves from Saul, but God is going to take him from the cave to the throne room. We talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God could have certainly quenched the fire. He could have done anything that he wanted, but instead he allows his people to go into the fire. But he says, I'm going to make sure you're not burned while you're in there. Daniel falls into the lion's den, but he comes out with a few pet cats, right? Nothing happens. 
In Esther, what do we see? That God's name is not mentioned, but by the end of that book, God's works are impossible to ignore. And what about Jesus? I'm just telling you, it seemed like God was doing nothing on the cross. It seemed like God was doing nothing as Jesus breathed his last breath. It seemed like God was doing nothing as he took their body down, as they laid his son in the tomb, as they sealed up the grave. But how many of you know that Sunday morning we learned that God was doing something? He was doing something. And I'm just here to encourage you this morning that in moments and situations in our life when we might be like the servant of Elisha and we walk out and we feel surrounded and we feel like God is doing nothing and we feel like God is inactive, he is up to something. He's up to something. So trust his word. Trust in the hope of the gospel. Trust not in what you see, but what he says, because his word is true. The narrative and the story of scripture is true, that all throughout these stories, we see that God was up to something. So the next time in your life, think about Abraham. Think about the people of Israel. Think about Ruth. Think about David. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Think about Esther, but most importantly, think about Jesus. When it seemed like God was up to nothing, he was doing something. You know, you might not see what God was doing in the next week. You you might not see what God is doing in the next month. Maybe not in the next year. This is another sermon for another day, but maybe not in your life. We don't like to talk about that, but the people of Israel were enslaved for 430 years, weren't they? You might not see it. But I believe on the authority of God's word, he's doing something. And I have to believe it's a greater plan. It's a greater story. It's anything greater than I could possibly imagine. And when it seems like he's doing nothing, walk by faith, not by sight. Trust in his word and not what you see. Because he's up to something. He's up to something. Would you pray with me? And Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for this word this morning. Lord, I thank you for the the powerful reminder in 2 Kings that where the servant responds out of fear and he can't see what you're up to, he can't see what you're doing, but God, you are moving in an incredible way. I love it when Elijah prays and they open their eyes and they see that the mountains were already covered. You weren't covering them. You weren't beginning to cover them or before they even prayed, you were already doing something. When I pray for every single person in here, Lord, when some people raised their hand earlier, when asked if they've been in a situation that they felt like you were up to absolutely nothing, Lord, some of those people might be in that situation right now. They might be here this morning and have no idea what you're doing. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their faith this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill them with courage. And I pray that you would give them the gift to just be able to trust you. Or maybe even open up their eyes this morning to see what you've been doing. And Lord, even if you don't, help them to trust you along the way. Lord, I pray for the believer that might be getting ready to go into a situation like that. They're in a situation right now where it seems like everything you're doing, they can see and it's evident. Lord, I pray they will hide this word in their heart, Lord, for that moment when it comes, if it comes. Lord, I pray they trust you. Lord, I pray if there's someone here that's never placed their faith and trust in you, and maybe the reason that they've never done that is because it seemed like you were so absent in their life. Maybe for their whole life, it seems like you were doing nothing. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw that person unto yourself today. Lord, I pray that maybe someone here would place their faith and trust in you this morning and would come down and meet me at the front. Lord, I love you and I love this church, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to be here this morning. In your name we pray. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.